Um, let's see. Get that going. I want to swap that. Yep, that's better. I also want to move. Let's see. Let's move that over here to the side. Hey, Richard, glad you could join us. And we'll put that there. Bring this up here. Swap it again. Turn my camera off. Hopefully you can still hear me. And there we go. OK, hopefully you should have like a screen playing away with some animation. Is that correct, Kelly? Yes, looks good. All right, we are good to go. OK, all right. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm David Hobson. I work at the Research Innovation Office and I manage a lot of IP for the university and I'm here to talk about IP and how it might relate to your concerns at the University of Guelph, whether you're a student, staff or faculty. OK, um, today we do. Today we're going to talk. I'll give you a very brief one minute introduction to the Research Innovation Office so you know that we do more than just deal with intellectual property. Um, I'll talk to you about managing intellectual property at the U of G, kind of the rules and policies. Then we'll get into the essentials of IP in all different forms. And if we have time, we'll have discussions and questions at the end. I'll try to do that within an hour so you guys can get back to all the important stuff you're doing. OK, so the Research Innovation Office, we have three main pillars. We help uh, researchers create stuff, collaborate with industry, and to commercialize the results of whatever it is you have created. We have four main uh, resources that you can tap into. That's our industry liaison team, and that's usually when you start talking to industry. How do we help you do that? Our knowledge mobilization team, which is about helping you tell stories to the world about the great work you're doing in research. There's technology transfer, which is, is about trying to take your intellectual property and and to transfer it over to industry, usually through some kind of a patent deal or, or agreement, license agreement. And then our, there's our new venture creation team, which helps you create a startup company related to or based on the foundation of your research. So those are kind of our four teams we have to help you create, collaborate and commercialize. So. Getting right into the intellectual property essentials, which is kind of what this hour presentation is all about. Uh, why should you bother to care about intellectual property? A lot of times it gets a bad rap and I want to just get right into the big picture, which I think is important, which some of you realize, but some of you may not realize how important it is, is that academics actually change the world through intellectual property. Um, the world of innovation is largely facilitated through the creation of new products and services and that those new products and services most often attract investment and attract enthusiasm when there's intellectual property attached to them so that people will bring them to market and to make something that's useful. And usually there's some form of profit motive uh, dealt in there. Um, but that's the that's the way the world works. It's a capitalistic world and people want new products to make the world a better place. And profit is one of those motivators, uh, but also just stopping people from copying what you've done so that you can keep it into a kind of a professional package is also important. One of the latest and greatest inventions recently was the CRISPR Cas9 uh, at, at UC Berkeley and uh, at, uh, in Berkeley by Jennifer Dudna and uh, as well as her uh, her other Nobel winner, uh, winner over in Berlin. But, um, you know, things to think about, you know, insulin invented at the University of Toronto. OK, there was intellectual property on that it changed the world, made life a lot easier for diabetics. They also did the electron microscope. And there's lots of many other things, Blackberry being one in the IT space that a lot of you know, and there was a lot of intellectual property there. So intellectual property is important, maybe not for you in the immediate short term, but in the long term, that's what drives the country. 
That's what drives new products. That's what drives our ecosystem, our standard of living, and um, everything that we do to maintain a, a, a safe and um, comfortable country. So along with intellectual property, part one of the motives of our office is to get you to think more like an entrepreneur. And this doesn't mean you got to quit your job and go start a company, but the principles of entrepreneurship can be used anywhere. And you can also use those principles inside the corporation, inside uh, an institution like the University of Guelph, and we call that intrapreneurship. So you can be an intrapreneur. The idea is about harnessing creativity to do new things and uh, doing things the same way as you have in the past often hinders that creativity and hinders innovation. So being an, an entrepreneur at say the university is something that we strive to help you to do. All right, IP is all, almost always related to inventions. And I just wanna be really clear that our goal here is not just to get you to create inventions. We want you to create innovations. We want you to do things that make a difference in the world. There are a lot of inventions out there that um, have no application. So what academics often do is they focus on, what's, focus on what is technically feasible. And that obviously there's lots of options there. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, you could build a, you could build a device that could take you to the sun, but nobody's going to buy it. All right. Sometimes you focus on what's cheap and easy to do. Again, it has to be something that's solving a real problem in the real world. So my re recommendation to you is that once you understand your applied science is that you focus on what is desirable by the world. What are the problems they need solved? What do customers want? So focusing on the customer's desires is where you should be starting once you understand the science behind your invention, okay? So innovation doesn't exist until you have a customer. It's just an invention, and if it never gets used, that's all it is, it's just an invention. It has no impact. So try and, try and focus on turning your inventions into an innovation. Next, what is intellectual property? Well, uh, it's an intangible asset, but in short, it is original works of the human mind. All right, so intellectual property must be created by the creative process inside a human head. Artificial intelligence can't create intellectual property. That's just the way it is. Um, it often comes in two main forms, which is a commercial function. So that's something that's kind of practical and useful. And a lot of people think of intellectual property when they think about drugs or new materials like carbon fiber cars or machines like the printing press or the steam engine. Or it might be for methods of making things, okay? Um, a lot of manufacturing methods are, are patented, you know? The method for, you know, amplifying sequence, PCR, is a, is a, is a method uh, to amplify DNA, okay? So, that you know, these are functional, commercially focused um, in forms of intellectual property. And then there's artistic, which is all about uh, the creative expression. Things like music and literature. Uh, software is considered an expression, surprisingly enough. Um, and things like paintings, all right? Every country has their own set of laws, but most of them are harmonized. So they're pretty, they're pretty standard across most of the, certainly the G20. Um, and so, you know, these, you know, whatever IP is and how it is used and how it is protected is protected in each country according to that country's laws. So who is an inventor? This is something that a lot of people get confused by. The inventor is the person that pulled the ideas out of their head. It has nothing to do with hard work or spending hours in the lab, all right? Every country defines this in their laws of their country. It's pretty much standard across most, most countries. So the inventor is the person that had added intellectual value to the final invention that gets used and approved, say, for example, in an issued patent, all right? Somebody might have, a technician could have had you know, put lots of time and effort into at the direction of someone else. They are putting labor in, they're putting effort in, but they're not legally defined as an inventor. So they will not get their name on a patent. They may share in the benefits, but that's different. That's about a legal sharing of benefits. So to be a legal inventor, you have to add creative value that adds to the final product that is approved by a patent or or whatever else a trademark, okay? So it's not your supervisor, it's not the University of Guelph, it's not an employer, it's not your friends, 
Um, and it has nothing to do, like I said, nothing to do with hard work. So really, this is all about rewarding the first people that are truly creative. You know, as Einstein would say, you know, creativity is the rarest of substances. So coming up with that inventive stuff and thinking about something new that might happen is the person who's the inventor. So one thing that I recommend is that once you do come up with those eureka thoughts is that you keep excellent records. And when you come up with new and improved versions of do the same thing, date, sign, witness them if you can, because sometimes you will run into a conflict and there'll be fights for inventorship. Certainly when the stakes get big and the, and the money is big, as in the drug industry, um, they'll try and disqualify each other for, for issues around inventorship. So now if we focus on the University of Guelph, who owns your intellectual property at the University of Guelph? Well, we changed the policy in 2014. It used to be the university, but now it is the creators. So if you create it, you own it. And there's only a couple of exceptions. So whether you're staff, whether you're student, undergrad, grad student, or your faculty, you create your IP unless you have made a promise to somebody else or through a written agreement to somebody else, okay? So as, along with this policy, you must report any new inventions that you create. If your research comes up with something and you say that, hey, this is, this is really commercially useful, then you have to tell us. It's confidential. You fill out a report of invention. You tell us what you have, and then you tell us what you want to do with it. You may want to own it yourself, or you may want to give it to the university. And then we take a look at that. If you want to own it yourself, then what we do is we make sure that you haven't made any promises to maybe an industry funder or to somebody maybe from OMAFRA or anything like that. And usually what we're doing is we're looking at all the agreements that you're working on and their funding agreements to make sure there's no, no conflict in, in terms of what's happening. And if there isn't, then we're, we don't assess your invention. Then we say, fine, go forth and prosper. You can own it yourself and, 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 and do what you like because you and the University of Guelph haven't given someone else a promise that they're going to either own it or use it or share in it or get some benefits from it. OK, so you need to understand your funding agreements. You can also choose to give it to the University of Guelph voluntarily. That would be our office. And then we take all the risk and all the cost. We spend all the money. We do all the work. But if we make a profit, which we call net revenue, which is the revenue we collect minus the patent expenses, then we will share that net revenue with you, the inventor team, 50-50, okay? If you want, you can put it in your own startup company. Um, you could also give it or sell it to your industry partner. You could do something there, or you could just put it in the public domain and say, no, I, I don't want to protect it. I just want the, you know, that's what we did uh, with the Yukon Gold Potato, you know? The, um, I think it was Jones. I mean, they invented the Yukon gold potato and they put it in the public domain and said, everybody can use this potato. Had they protected it with plant breeders rights, they would have made a lot of money because it's a very popular potato. So one of the things, look at your funding agreement because it will often provide constraints on what you can do with your IP that you create in your research project. OMAFRA definitely does. OMAFRA says you have to work with us at the University of Guelph. So you can still benefit from it, um, you just can't go off on your own privately. And industry-sponsored research almost always has some kind of strings attached, all right? Now, the only other exception to this is that say you're a computer programmer, you're hired by the, hired by the computing department uh, to write computer code. Well, you're doing that specifically to write code to run the processes at the university. So in that case, your specific job is to create that. Or if I'm writing copy for communications and uh, for advertising, I'm paid to do that creation process. As a researcher, you're not paid to create IP. You're paid to create knowledge, um, not IP. So when it comes to managing these personal assets now, your personal intellectual property, um, all the creators in our eyes at the University of Guelph are treated equally. So a professor may be running a project, but a grad student is considered an equal inventor or an undergrad student or even a third party. It could be another scientist from another university. We treat them all equally um, and uh, unless there's otherwise some kind of uh, written agreement that they'll be treated in some other way. OK, the the promises that uh, you or the university has made linked to funding 
can create some snags. So be very clear and understand what those are before you decide to move off and do something off campus with your own intellectual property. OK, and part of our job is to make sure that those have been we've clarified what those are um, so that we don't go in the wrong direction. It's also important to understand that if you're working on two or three projects at the same time, sometimes there can be IP that's overlapping multiple projects. So you have to be careful there. Um, you wanna try and keep your projects separate. And sometimes that's hard as a researcher because you're playing in many different, you know, scientific knowledge creation fields. So if they are overlapping, you could end up having actually two industry partners who may have a small stake in, in the same piece of intellectual property because it was kind of used in multiple times um, or in multiple projects with multiple students, okay? The other thing is that if you're gonna accept funding from somebody, especially industry, there's almost always a string attached. So this usually means you have to give up some of your personal uh, intellectual property rights. And most often it's uh, you give the industry partner an option to license whatever comes out of the research. OK, doesn't say what price, doesn't say what the terms are, but they'll get at least they get an option so it doesn't automatically go to the competition so they know they have a chance to get it. Um, and in, sometimes industry will walk away if they if they don't feel like they have enough of the IP. Some some companies actually want all of the IP 100% and if you don't give it to them, then they don't want to fund your research and that's their choice. Others are not that interested. Some just want an option. So those are things that are, are very important for you to consider. And then the last thing is that if you have a team of five people who invented something at the university or even co-inventors at other universities, it's up to you as the co-inventors to decide how you're going to share any potential revenue that develops. Revenue often takes five years before it even starts to come in with the patent. But let's say, you know, there's $100,000 a year that, that comes in from a patent from, a, say, a drug company that's paying us for the patent. Well, then $50,000 of that would be paid to the inventors. And if there's five inventors, you may split that equally and each inventor gets $10,000. Or you may say, well, really, this was mostly one person's creative ideas and we helped a little bit. We tweaked it. And so one person might get 80 percent and the other four people might get 20 percent. That's up to you guys to decide. We're not going to get involved in that unless we think somebody's taking advantage of another person. OK. So the other thing is that so say you invent something and say you even patent it. Can you use your invention? Well, actually, sometimes and sometimes not. So this is something called freedom to operate. So what it means is that, you know, you may have invented something, but there might be other patents or other forms of intellectual property protection out there that are somehow embedded or in, involved in a portion of your invention. So you may actually need to go back to people in the past who have tried to protect their intellectual property from five years, 10 years ago, and ask their permission to use your invention for commercial purposes, okay? As academic researchers, you can do almost anything on academic research if you're just doing it to create knowledge because you're not trying to make money off of it, all right? So sometimes you don't have freedom to operate. The simplest example I can give you is when you first patented the tire for a car, it didn't have tread. Well, then somebody else invented something with tread. Well, they needed to license the patent to the tire in order to use their patent for adding tread to a tire, which is, you know, a, a, a rougher surface to, for traction. OK, so that that's just a, an example. So sometimes you need this commercial access to what we call background intellectual property, stuff that happened before uh, you created your invention. The other thing is that competing companies. So I might invent PCR and you invent a better version, a new and improved PCR. But my patent says nobody can use PCR unless you license the basic PCR from me. So I can stop you from using your invention. And so this is what competitors do to each other. So they block each other. So Apple and Samsung do that all the time. And then eventually they may come to a deal where they say, fine, we'll let you use this for this amount of money or you let us use your invention if we get to if, if we get to swap and use uh, the other party's invention. So they kind of do what's called cross licensing. So the other thing is that if you have joint inventorship, if you have five inventors, um, then in some countries, if you don't all agree on what you want to do with your invention, the other inventors can block what can be done. So sometimes you need agreement where the, the owners of the patent all have to agree on what they want to do, except in the United States. In the United States, you could have 
you know, co-owners. So, you know, of, of a patent and they can both do whatever they want and actually compete with each other. So it's a little, little, a little bit of a different system there. So you have to be careful there. So next, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about intellectual property as it relates to when you're doing R&D with industry. Uh, probably the most important point that I can make is that clarify what your expectations for our, for intellectual property is very early in the process, okay? Industry is often not coming to the university just to be uh, philanthropic and give you money so you can go ahead and do cool things, although sometimes they do do that. Those are usually the very profitable companies and they just they want to make society better by showing some goodwill. But most of the time they want you to solve their problem and they want the solution, which often can have some intellectual property in it. Uh, to be useful to them, not to their competition. So you got to clarify, you know, do you think you're going to be able to create some IP from this research or is it just going to be more validating what we already know? If we do create IP, how can we work together so that the company benefits? Because if the company doesn't benefit, well, then they, maybe they're going to walk away and they don't want to fund that. So clarify your personal and the university's expectations for IP creation, how it's going to be managed, who's going to own it. And you should talk about things like inventorship, ownership, the path to commercialization. You don't have to spend a ton of time, but you should at least uh, be open to having those discussions that, yes, well, we expect the company to do the commercialization. If we have any co-inventors, we all agree that we're going to try and work together so that the company can at least bring a product to the market because the research in the end is about trying to get used for something that has a practical use. The other thing is you you should try and work non-confidentially, okay? If a company gives you confidential information, that usually means that they can stop you from ever publishing that confidential information. So if you don't need the information from the company, don't ask for it. Get the problem statement, figure out what you need to do, and then you can work academically on what you need to do without them pulling their private information out of your publication or out of uh, or, or refusing to let you share it with other people that are important for the project. So try and work non-confidentially as much as you can. If you can't, then use a non-disclosure agreement, use a collaboration agreement. Sometimes you even have to use a non-use agreement where you have background IP or you have work in progress that is you know, not published yet and you have to make sure that they don't use that for some other purpose other than specifically your research project that you're collaborating on okay the other thing is be careful verbal agreements can be legal too you might tell them or give them the impression that oh yeah sure no problem you can have all the ip no problem um you know you may even say the word free well, you you are walking on the ground of forming a legal agreement where you said, let's work together and you can do this. So unless you paper that with a written agreement, you verbally might have just committed to giving them something. So be careful. Clarity and communication is very important here. Be reasonable and pick your battles. Um, just because you have an idea for research and you think that idea is going to be a better mousetrap and that that uh, can be a patent and you're going to be rich. It's probably not true. Ideas are a dime a dozen. It's all about the execution. It's what you do with the idea that matters. How do you move that idea forward into something that's useful, practical, potentially profitable, and protectable? Is that is that idea in its product form protectable? And that's usually what we call intellectual property. The next thing is you should understand, and I recommend most times that you avoid fee-for-service projects because essentially they want to pay you to do stuff like a consultant, which is we pay you a fee, we own everything. You don't publish it. We just want you to give us the results and we want to use it for whatever we want. Yes, there's modifications that can happen there, but just be careful because you know that that's what a consultant does. I'll give you advice, but nobody else knows. You use the advice for whatever you need or I'll do the work and you have total control over the work and they want to keep it secret. And academia normally doesn't work that way. The next thing is you need to understand what's going to cause the parties to walk away from each other, okay? What are your deal breakers? And IP is often a deal breaker. So you, it's best, that's why I say, talk about it early. And really, um, you all, both parties need to think about, you know, what's the best alternative to no agreement? You know, where, well, if I can't get this, company to fund us because uh, IP is a problem. What is my alternative? Not doing the project? 
doing the project under an insert grant, doing the project with another company. As long as you know what your alternatives are, if the deal falls apart, then at least you understand your options. If there are no other options, well, then you better, when you walk away, it means you're not going to do the project. Okay, so that's called your BATNA. So understand what the deal breakers are for both sides. And sometimes you need to talk about them, especially, I mean, in the drug industry, especially that's really important. Um, when you're doing collaborative research with academia related to new drugs uh, or vaccines. The other thing is that partnerships and these collaboration, it's about people, not the technology. So yes, the technology is important, but if the people start getting angry at each other, the whole thing falls apart. So it's a relationship. You got to keep it working. Next is trust and dependability that, you know, both parties need to depend on each other to get the job done. And they need to depend on them to be truthful and transparent. So trust is extremely important when you're creating new IP and especially when it's funded by industry. All right. Lastly, keep good records, as I've already stated. So when we take a look at intellectual property, the big picture here is what are the main tools that are used and why do they use them? Well, patents, which often get a bad rap, but they're just a tool that can be used well or it can be used poorly, is that patents are all about protecting the novel function of something, how something works, what it does. Utility models, which is mainly a Chinese uh, weaker version of a patent. They also have patents, but they also have patents and utility models. It's just like a patent that protects the function, but to lower standards. Um, they're trying to do the best they can to keep as things in China as much as possible. So that's kind of unique, unique to China. Industrial designs are all about how things look. Apple has many patents just on, you know, the shapes and the curves and the, the lights and how things look. It has nothing to do with how it works. All right. But that's important because when people try to copy it, they want to make it look like an Apple, even though it doesn't work like an Apple. Um, and that's how they can make counterfeit um, things. So industrial designs are important. Copyright is all about people's personal creative expression. All right. Like I said, music, novels, unfortunately, even software. Uh, trademarks are all about your reputation. It's all about, you know, you know, this trademark says that this came from a specific company. Therefore, I understand the quality and the functionality that it should give me. And again, this is something that is counterfeited a lot. Uh, plant breeders rights is all about function in a, a new stable plant variety. So if I breed wheat together, eventually I can get a stable variety that it's the same every time. That's like a patent, but it's actually called plant breeders rights. You can also patent plants as well, but that's from a different perspective. That's more on you oftentimes things like, you know, uh, genetically engineered genes and things like that. Um, and integrated circuit design is all about the layout of these circuits that you put in chips. Trade secrets about any information you can keep a secret, which is a lot harder than people think. Um, but that is absolutely the most common form of intellectual property because companies just how they run their company internally is uh, it's just a secret. They just need to use it in their own company. They're not wanting to share it. And lastly, uh, a lot of intellectual property is managed just by a legal contract. That's how Monsanto sells a lot of their seeds. You want to buy our seeds? Great. But the one thing is that you legally agree that you're not going to harvest any of the seed to plant to make more seed for yourself. That turned into a lawsuit. You signed it, so you agreed to it. So really, if you did that, you're breaking a legal contract. So you defaulted on your promise. Okay. Um, David? Yeah. Can I if you go back a slide. Um, yeah. Can you tell me the percentage of the IP applications that you've received at the University of Guelph that would fit in, the, they'll say, the from patents to trademarks? Which ones have you done more of? We almost never get trademarks because reputation and branding is all about a company once you're up and selling products. OK, I mean, we do have trademarks for the University of Guelph um, and those are managed, our logo, our cornerstone. Um, uh, our wording, our improved life, uh, all that kind of stuff. But almost never do we get people at the university uh, submitting, hey, I have a trademark for something that I want to do something. I mean, let's talk science. We have that tomato sphere. You know, that's kind of, you know, Mike Dixon's lab, which was putting tomatoes up in space and stuff like that. So we have a few, but very few. Um, I would say 90 
90 to 95 percent of the inventions that come into our office are things that should be patented or are wanting or desiring to get a patent. About the other five to 10 percent are industrial designs, which is actually maybe a functional issue of how something looks, but the look and function go hand in hand. And um, and uh, Max Jones had some of those things with some of his research tools and devices for doing uh, plant cell culture, you know, where you're growing individual plant cells into plants. Um, and so how you designed the, the device actually was the look, but the look also then ended up uh, affecting the function. Okay, so thanks, David. OK. Uh, we do some plant breeders rights as well, but we also commercialize a lot of plants just under legal contract. OK, so question for you. So don't mute your mic yet, Vern. Um, a patent gives the patent owner the legal right to do what? And the patent owner, I mean, if you're an inventor, you may be the patent owner, you may not. Uh, if the university is managing it, the University of Guelph would own the patent, but the inventors would actually be the researchers who did it. So we legally own the patent. So if we have a patent, what right does it give the University of Guelph? Any idea? Just shout it out if you have a, if you have an idea. D? D? You guys are too smart. I usually get a couple of, of, of A's and B's before we get to, uh, to, to D. Exactly right. Um, so it's a negative right. And so this is important. And a lot of people don't realize this, that a patent doesn't give you any benefit to make money other than to chase your competition who are copying you. So what do you have to do? You have to first find the people that are copying. So those are the infringers. So that's called detection of infringement, which is hard sometimes because sometimes they're copying you behind closed doors. Then you have to take them to court in front of a judge and pay for all of that. Then you have to prove to the court that they are infringing on your patent, so your patent's valid. And then you'll have to try and get them to pay you for what they were supposed to pay you. So it's a negative right. It gives you the right to stop the people from copying. There's no guarantee you're going to make money. The government isn't going to step in. Uh, it has nothing to do with whether you can commercialize the invention. And oftentimes, if you don't have freedom to operate, you can't commercialize the invention. OK, so it's very important that you realize that you have a lot of work to do when you have to chase the people that are copying your invention. The more valuable your invention, the more people that are going to copy it. OK, so what's what, what's a patent all about? As we said, it's about the novel function. In order to get a patent, you need to basically meet these five criteria. So first, you have to be the first person the, the first inventors to have ever created that specific invention. So never made by anywhere else, anywhere in the world. Um, and so there's no documents or no evidence that somebody else has made it before. All right, can't be publicly disclosed. Most often inventors in the academic world, their own work stops them from actually getting a patent because they talked about their invention three or four years ago, and then they tried to file it today and that previous discussion in a paper or where you where you talked about what could work or should work says, well, it's publicly disclosed. Just so happens you're the person who did it. So you have to be very careful what you actually publish yourself. In, um, academics are often used against themselves to say that, well, you've all disclosed too much of this publicly in the past. It has to be useful. If it's, if it's man-made and you're trying to solve a problem, it's almost always useful. So that's rarely a problem, but it has to be non-obvious. And this is really hard because um, the what the patent offices do is they look at your invention and they say, what would somebody else who has a similar background, if you're a research science scientist in you know, animal biotech, uh, what would another you know, average person in animal biotech do if they saw this information, would they have would they have come up to the same improvement or invention? Is it an obvious next step? Uh, putting tread on a tire may not have been obvious 200 years ago, but obviously, but now putting tread on a tire that has, you know, smaller grooves or softer rubber to stick on ice is now considered obvious. So it evolves as the level of prior art, which is knowledge in the public domain, advances. 
So you have to really have an inventive step. It has to be kind of, you know, more than just a subtle improvement to make something just a little bit better because that's too obvious. The next thing, it has to be patentable subject matter, which most of the time is fine as long as it's man-made, but you can't patent mother nature is the, is the exception, all right? And you can't patent abstract ideas. So it's not about mathematical, mathematical formulas and things like that. So patents have to be about putting something into a practical purpose. We call that reduction to practice, where you describe what you make and you actually have to build one of them. Um, and then lastly, to get a patent approved, you have to describe exactly how to make and copy your invention. So that's the social contract so that uh, you're sharing that so people can learn and use that for other innovations, but they can, but they agree not to copy it if your patent gets approved. And so you cannot leave a step out. So some people like to be vague in how they describe their invention. So when somebody reads the patent and they try and do it, it doesn't work right. Well, actually you patent can be invalidated for doing that because you're purposely trying not to enable the invention, enable the instructions for how exactly to build and use your invention. All right. And then the last thing is you have to be the first one to the patent office to say, hey, here's my paperwork for the invention. You might have invented it five years ago, but it's actually the first one that submits their paperwork to the office that gets looked at first. If you kept it a trade secret for five years, then you might be out of luck. All right, getting into the main things that people use for, for, uh, for protecting um, intellectual property. Patents are obviously, you know, the big, sexy, contentious issue that people have, you know, either love it or hate it. And it, with patents, the best patent is a composition of matter. That's stuff like a drug. You come up with a new synthetic molecule. The most biology molecule ever created to date so far is Lipitor. I think it was 130 five billion dollar patent um and so that composition of matter is a specific molecule nobody else can use that molecule for anything including treating high cholesterol it could be for methods how to make stuff how to make could also again be drugs how to make steel how to make uh, glass how to um you know any form of method it also could be on the new use of a material. So, you know, how you, you know, you might use primers for this purpose and then you can use that DNA, RNA or whatever for another purpose. So it's a it's a new use of the same material that is already known. It's not the material that's patented, it's how you use it that, that, that is important. Or it could be a machine, a device and software. Um, and as I said, patents are not really made for software, but there are a lot of software patents now just because software is so important now. Patent lasts for 20 years and then it's dead. It's worth nothing. Um, so you got to make your money while the patent is valid. And this is why it's a problem with drugs, because once drugs go off patent, they all get copied. Um, and it varies by country, but uh, patents are really expensive. I mean, you could you can sometimes spend $500,000 for one country to get that patent. And if you have a new drug, you often are going to patent in, you know, 10 to 20 countries, even more sometimes if it's a really valuable drug. So patents can be really expensive to pay for, apply and get. Uh, here in the Canadian Intellectual Property Office, it often takes us five years before we get a patent approved. We can push it and sometimes get it in two. The US is a little bit faster, um, but it takes a while and you're spending money that whole time. So the whole idea of a patent is to file that patent first, to scare away your competition. So that's, you know, that's insurance to keep you in the market and to slow down the competition so they don't copy you. Until your patent is approved, they might be copying you. But once your patent's approved, then you can tell them not to copy you and even potentially ask for damages for copying you while the patent was in prosecution. Okay. So patents are all about slowing down the competition so you get a head start and you can make some money. Once it goes off patent, they're all going to copy you and do the same thing or make new and improved versions of it. Trademarks, again, about reputation. You can trademark just about anything, whether it's a shape or a smell, a sound. Um, they're very useful because they are all about customer loyalty. You you get 15 years at a time, but you can keep renewing it. So, you know, Coca-Cola is a huge, you got a huge trademark. So does Nike. They just keep, they very valuable, okay? Once you are a company that's successful, your trademark is more valuable than your patents. Um, they're relatively cheap to get, and you can usually get them, you know, in a matter of months. And it's all about maximizing the loyalty with your customers. 
Copyright is something that's super easy to get. You don't even have to register it if you don't want to. It's protected by common law. And it's anything original and tangible that you do. You write an essay for a test uh, in, in, at university, that's actually a copyright. It's your personal work and that essay is yours. Um, and you know, you put a date on it in your name, it's technically copyright. Nobody can copy that essay exactly without your permission. Um, so it has to be original, it has to be human expression, can't be generated by a computer. Um, and again, this is also something that you can use for software, which most often is, although mo a lot of software is protected by a trade secret uh, just because you encrypt the software. Okay, slightly different by years, but in general, it's your lifetime plus 50 years in Canada. And because of Walt Disney in the United States, it's your lifetime plus 70 years because it's just Walt Disney's copyright portfolio is so valuable. So they lobbied the Congress. Um, uh, it can cost you anywhere from doing it yourself from, you know, a couple hundred bucks to if it's really complex, you know, it might cost you $10,000. But often you can just do it free by just proving that you've created it and keeping a copy of it. Super easy to do and you're just basically protecting your word. Novels and music are big in this area. Next, how much does it cost to get a patent? Well, the short answer, $30,000. If you're, if you're not going to budget $30,000 uh, and you're not expecting to get paid back $30,000 or the value of protecting your sales while you hold the patent is not worth $30,000, you're going to lose money. Unfortunately, most people lose money with patents. It's just most people patent things that shouldn't be patented or they patent things that nobody wants. So they end up spending $30,000 and they can't figure out, you know, why didn't I become a gazillionaire? Well, it's because right off the bat, it usually costs you about $10,000 to get a really good patent application written and filed. And then you, it, during this, this next five years, it's all about what's called patent prosecution, which means you're fighting with the patent office to get your patent approved. Their job is to be really tough and not give it to you, and you have to prove that you deserve it. That's like going to court and arguing with lawyers. So now you're up to like $20,000 and then so say you get your patent approved. Well, then it's like a car. You got to get up. You got to pay for annual license fees and that brings it up. So you're looking at a minimum of $30,000 just to hold one U.S. patent. So it's not cheap. So don't enter it. It's not a get rich quick scheme. So why do companies want these patents? Obviously, because they want to slow down the competition. They want to stay in business. And because the market is big enough that slowing them down is worth their while. It's worth spending that thirty or maybe $100,000 for a patent. It helps them increase their sales and profits for those 20 years. Um, although usually most patents, you only get about 15 years because your patent doesn't get approved for the first five. You get to increase your market uh, market share. So the longer you hold on to that market, that that means that your company has a better chance of long term survival. The other thing is, is that you can use patents to generate revenue. And this is what the university does. What we do is we're what's called an NPE, a non practicing entity. So you as inventors, you invent something, you give it to us, we patent it, and then we license those patents to companies to actually build the products. We don't build the product. We, the university owns the patent, but we then enable a drug company to use that molecule to make a drug. And then they in return pay us royalties, which we then split and pay back to the inventors. And so we are a non-practicing entity, and that brings money into the university to support more research. We don't make a profit, we don't make money, our office is not a profit center for the university. This is largely about enabling good research to get to the real world and get used. At best, we break even. Um, so for companies also, this is a very positive image for their company. Uh, the company in the world that has the most patents is IBM. They, you know, they file thousands of patent applications every year every year and they've been the leader for the past 20 years so it's amazing um the other thing is it increases your negotiating power if you have patents then you can negotiate with people on how you might work together or you negotiate with people who are attacking you so this is what apple and samsung do with each other you know they're fighting with each other about we have this patent you have that patent eventually they usually saw off with a, a some kind of negotiation that says fine we'll stop taking you to court if you stop taking us to court why you as an academic should care about patents? Well, probably the biggest reason is because you'll have a higher probability of getting research funding, uh, mainly from government and potentially industry. If you have patents, it means that it's you're closer to a practical solution that everybody wants. The government wants economic development, so do companies. 
The other thing is there might be business opportunities for you personally or for you with the university to do work in a certain space if you have patents that, that can protect things or potential patents, patents that are pending. The other thing is it helps you look in behind the curtain of companies. So this is strategic planning. So with companies, uh, all these patents are published. So at most, they're confidential for 18 months. Many of them are only confidential for six to 12 months. And then you can see, okay, what products are uh, Apple and Samsung and Alanco and Monsanto? What new products are they potentially bringing out in the next five years? Well, just go take a look at their patents that are pending. What patents did they file in the last six months? That gives you an idea because that's where they're putting their money. That's why they bothered to file the patent. Okay. The other thing is the last thing, and I, I recommend a lot of you promote your grad students to do this, is use it as an educational resource. There's lots of stuff in the patents that are never published in academic journals. So you can get lots of new ideas. You can see who are working on what areas, how they do things, their methods. Um, you can verify if you have freedom to operate, if you happen to have your own patent to make sure that you're not stepping on their feet. It also helps you understand the competition and where they might be going, maybe to go get a job, right? Because grad students are like, hey, that's a hey, synthetic biology related to, you know, plant expression of antibodies. Yeah, hey, I want to go to that company. Um, that helps, you know, maybe a grad student get a job in terms of understanding the future plants. It also might help you collaborate with them, either academically or from an industrial standpoint. OK, and also if you are actually trying to patent something yourself, well, you have to do that to figure out whether what you have can be patented because somebody might have already beat you to it or they're close enough that you're never going to get your patent approved. If you want to search, there's lots of databases. The easiest way is go to Google Patents and there's a help screen. It can teach you and just go through that google's amazingly smart uh, it's becoming a, a, an excellent database but there's also a database i really like called the lens and that's also free and that's very good it's a little more structured it takes a little little more time to learn better for genomics because they have you know they can look at sequencing stuff um, the best database is a space net in europe um, but it's more complicated needs more training and then also sometimes just because the U.S. is the center of the universe still when it comes to intellectual property, you might go to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. OK, every country has a search engine. Um, I rarely go to the Canadian one because it's just two percent of the globe. It's, it's not a big enough database, um, but Google Patents is a great place to start. So next we talked about freedom to operate and improvements. Most inventions are improvements on somebody else's invention, just like most research is taking somebody else's previous research and making it better. Um, and so just realize that an improvement is just a new invention based on an old invention. And uh, as I say here, 90% of most patents nowadays are just improvements. You know, it's part of the evolution progress, uh, just like software 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, uh, the next iPhone, same idea. And so be careful, though, because freedom to operate can always be an, an issue. You think you have a great invention, but you may never get to use it because somebody else has all of the other enabling tools locked up um, because you need that permission. The next thing is that this is a case of the drug industry is that patents don't have a lot of value in the beginning. They have lots of value when you're actually selling products. So you have a patent for a potential product. Well, if the market isn't wanting the product, you're not stopping anybody from making your product, right? Because you're not selling anything. So this is an example in the drug business where um, patents are really risky in the beginning, that red line, but then it goes down and they're, and they're not risky at all in the later stages of your patent after your drug is approved. But take a look in the drug industry, it can take 15 years to get your drug approved. So until your drug's approved, you're not stopping anybody from using your from from making the product that your patent protects. And so it's only at the end when you get the most value out of your patent when you're actually selling those drugs. OK, so the value of the patent goes up as you sell more and more products. In this case, in the drug industry, often you don't even start selling products uh, until you get regulatory approval at 15 years. So you only have five years to sell your product. So a 20 year patent only has five years to stop your competition. That's why a lot of the drug prices are so high because they're getting, trying to recoup all that R&D in five years versus 20 years. So a few, you can read most of this, but uh, I'll just go over the red highlights here, which is uh, the if you own a patent, your success rate in court 
is only about 37%. So people are stealing your invention, but you only have the only win and stop them about 37% of the time. And that's if me, I'm actually making the product. If I'm a university, a non-practicing entity, it's even lower. Okay. The other thing, and these are US numbers. Uh, they, there's, they have the biggest database to look at these. Um, and even if you win your case in court, stop infringing on my patent, that will end up getting appealed 78% of the time. And then even if you had an award, the award then gets adjusted up or down, often down. Okay, so where are mo what, what's most of the litigation for, for, you know, for patents? Consumer products, valuable, uh, widely spread consumer products like think smartphones, Apple and Samsung. And what are the other area? Drugs. Think biotech drugs. Okay, think CRISPR-Cas9. So maybe you don't want to patent something. Maybe you want to use a trade secret. And that's what most of industry does because all they care about is that they can keep doing what they want in their company and that's it. They don't, they don't want to do anything else. So if you have a product, say like a computer chip, that is really hard to reverse engineer, like you can't take that chip apart and figure out how the circuits uh, work inside it, um, then that, that could be really good for a trade secret. Okay, because when you patent it, you tell the world exactly how to do it. You tell them how to copy it, and then you have to catch them when they copy it. So a trade secret is good for that. A trade secret is also good if you're a small company and you're going up against Google. Okay, because then they don't know about it. And then maybe you can negotiate behind the scenes because what Google can do is they can they can just take your invention and you take them to court, but they can keep you in court forever until you're out of money. And then it all goes away. So they can outspend you because they just have a billion times more money than you do if you're just a small company of five people. The other thing is that if the people that are stealing your invention, infringing on your invention are a bunch of individuals like students downloading music illegally or, uh, you know, or academics or a lot of individual people that are just copying a little bit, you're not going to take millions of people individually to court. Okay. It's just not practical and it's also terrible PR. Napster did it, but it's it's terrible PR. Um, also, if the market is improving really quickly, so the level of improvement and advancement, uh, evolution, things like software, you know, I don't know why you bother to patent software. In two years, it's obsolete. So you got a 20 year patent on it. You're better just to encrypt it and use it and get out there and use it and then come out with a better version. And when the competition is coming out with their version, they're already three versions behind. All right. So when the life cycle is too fast, patents don't work very well. The other thing is if it's a recipe, you know, and, and here with our food science department, you came up with something. Oh, this is great. You put all these ingredients together. Well, if I take one ingredient out of that recipe, I'm not infringing on your patent. So, again, sometimes better just to keep that a trade secret. Coca-Cola, perfect example. That's been a trade secret for over 100 years. The recipe has also changed. Originally, I think it had cocaine in it, um, and now actually, I think the, the the recipe is changed and changed by geography according to taste. But it's all a trade secret. And the other thing is, if you want to protect what you have for more than twenty years, and you think you can, then you could use a trade secret. And as long as you keep it secret, then you can still keep protecting it. Um, Trademark, I'm not going to go into a lot of this because the academics often are not using trademarks a lot, but the basis of trademarks came out of China when there were really good, really good tradesmen or people uh, that made pots and people wanted to buy the highest quality pottery. So they looked for the trade person's mark on the bottom of the pot and they knew this one made the best quality pots. So that was their trademark. And so it's all about the reputation and the quality of what you're going to buy. So you look for the trademark. OK, that is it. I'm sorry, I only have five minutes for questions, but I can hang around for half an hour if anybody wants to. Here are some resources which you can access. You'll either get the slides or you'll uh, be able to see the program. Lots of things you can tap into if you want. And always you can always ask us for more resources or just ask us questions anytime by email or just, you know, call us up on Teams. And here's a little bit more. These are also really good resources if you want to do some self-help, teach yourself. Um, there's a ton of free information on the internet from lots of uh, lots of other academic institutions. So um, it, it's very easy to teach yourself, solve a problem if you have the time to do it. And often time is the limiting factor, okay? So from that, I'm going to open it up to questions and uh, 
leave it at that. Uh, anything you want to talk about? Hearing none could be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, David. Um, yes. On the application for, for, for patent, you said OMAFRA funding. Is that for tier one only? No. Uh, so any OMAFRA that goes through the alliance, okay, so it could be Griffin Lair or tier one. Um, would it be tier two? A any, any funding that goes through the Ontario Innovation Alliance through our agreement with OMAFRA, if you invent something, you must disclose it and give it to the University of Guelph to manage for you if we like it and think that that's the right thing to do. It, obviously, if we think the invention is not patentable and that and that it doesn't have a real commercial application, we'll just say, no, we're not interested in this. We'll tell OMAFRA the same thing and OMAFRA, you know, OMAFRA, do you want to try and commercialize this? Uh, and they have not yet ever done that, um, but they have that option. And if not, then you can go off and, and do what you like with it privately. But if we turn it down, usually that's a bad sign because um, usually, um, you know, we're, we're pretty supportive. And if there's a chance we can get a patent approved, we will try. Um, but OMAFRA does offer research programs outside of the Alliance as well, where that's open to other universities, including University of Guelph or including to companies even. And they do not have those intellectual property stipulations that you must work with the university uh, should your research project come up with a, a, you know, a new and great invention. Yeah, but the, the difference is that you, you didn't get the option to turn it down. I chose to take it. Now, what's the difference between the tier one and the tier two? Um, tier two, I believe, is just you're accessing research support on campus, but you're not actually asking for money from a MAFRA. Is that correct? I that's think that's correct. correct. Um, yeah. And Carolyn, Carolyn would know. See, I knew I was going to get you into this discussion. Um, I still believe that your acceptance of research support is considered a commitment to uh, OMAFRA and therefore agreement that you are using resources supported by OMAFRA. Therefore, you have to give it to the U of G. OK, um, but I, I will clarify that and uh, and get back to you, Vern. OK, because okay, because oftentimes if you're getting if you're using the Alora Research Station, um, you know, yes, you might be using money from another source, but um, quite often you're also using money from, you know, from tier one projects that are involved in that at some point in time as well. No tier one, all tier two, all tier two. OK, yeah. OK, I will get back to you on that. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm going to stop sharing. Anything else? You can contact me anytime by email, by Teams, by Zoom. You can. Um, I'm happy to sit down and have a coffee, talk for an hour about your specific problem or or just even interest in what your path is moving forward. We have a team of industry liaison officers that can help you working with industry to make sure your IP is managed there too. So it's all, all related. And if you're creating your own startup company, um, we have even had cases where the university has patented something. We control the intellectual property and we have licensed it to the startup company, which you may or may not actually have some ownership in. OK. You can ask questions in the chat, too, if you need to. Otherwise, I would just say speak out and Away we go. All right. OK. All right, thanks, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for attending. And um, yeah, we're here to help you with your IP issues. Let us know. And that'll be it for today. Great workshop. Thank you very much, David. Thank you. Bye, guys.